Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled 1001 Windbills of the Mind, a collection of quotes taken from what's often called the psychodynamic or the psychoanalytic perspective, which long ago, as I understand it, was referred to by some as philosophical medicine, because this perspective seeks to convert repetition into memory. Once we have memory, that means we can feel, then we're connected to ourselves, and then we don't need to repeat. We repeat uh, something that, that happened in childhood that was painful in the present, uh, symbolically recreated in the present, magically thinking uh, we can change the past. Again, in the unconscious, it's timeless. So in recent videos, we talked about, how, about the script or the schema. The child creates these templates and it's it's timeless so in the present the unconscious thinks it's still now so it's replaying uh, the trauma with the mother in the present with somebody else it, does, it doesn't understand time so one early quote in the collection is um, dysfunction is the, the repetition of the crystallization or um, of trauma uh, so it's sort of set there, meaning. Um, so 1001 Windmills of the Mind. Uh, is in the spirit of also trying to contribute towards the general effort to make the unconscious conscious. In yesterday's video, they made that point. The more there's the more there is in the unconscious, the more there is, the more dysfunction, because the more there, the more there is, more painful memories that the person experiences as a child, which are repressed, it is, it's going to distort perceptions in the present because of the repetition compulsion to replay the past and the present, making the past another timeless edition of the past, making the present another seemingly timeless edition of the past, trying to undo the original event or change it, get a better outcome. Um, so. Uh, to make a little more, to, uh, to offer a little more clarity, um, we have a complete thread in 1000 Watt Windmills of the Mind called Repetition Compulsion. And in the last video, we added a very good quote about it. Maybe I'll just bring it up quickly. Here. This was from yesterday's uh, one here. Let's see. Yeah, this one here. When clients find themselves in situations which activate, um, which activate their traumatic scripts. What they uh, usually are experiencing is a drama from their childhood, usually with a parent. Uh, clients regard clients uh, regard schemas um, as a prior, as a priori truths that paradoxically lead them to inadvertently recreate in their adult lives the conditions in the childhood which were most painful to them. We have approximately 100 quotes in this area that pretty much say something similar. And uh, the main metaphor we've been using is uh, the one by Edmund Burglar, one of our mentors. He says, um, every, um, every neurotic is a music enthusiast, he says. But he only has one record. Yeah. Um, or let's put it, or in, I guess in modern times we might say, he only has one uh, MP3 uh, file in his uh, MP3 music player. That doesn't quite work, does it? Huh? Let's stick, but <laughs> let's stick to the original. So every neurotic is a music enthusiast. He carries this, uh, but he only has one record, one of those original old vinyl music disc records. And he carries this record with him. Or long ago, it was the Victrola record. Right? And he carries this one a vinyl or Victrola record with him everywhere he goes. In each new situation, he spins off that one record. So that's uh, the idea that on the record is a, a painful memory. It's timeless, it's crystallized, and it's gonna repeat it to unthought. 
it's uh, or frozen. Another one, it's uh, another version of it is uh, dysfunction is uh, the repetition of a frozen childhood trauma, and they're trying to unfreeze it. You know? So they're replaying it symbolically in the present. Again, the unconscious is t doesn't understand time. It's always now in, in there. Right? So they're doing it again and again to try to get a better outcome. But the reality is we have a conscious. There is time. We have consciousness. We, there is such a thing as time. We're not stuck in one moment in time forever or emotionally, right? We do are meant to have new experiences, new loves, new, <laughs> you know, and so on, right? Uh, but if there's so much pain in the, if there's so much pain with the trauma, uh, uh, so Russell uh, offers some of the best material in this area. Paul Libby Russell, his articles have won a Golden Windmills of the Mind Award. One of his key points is that the child loses the, when when the child loses the safety with the mother because of her misattunement, malattunement, unavailability, etc. He, he, the basic trust is gone. He can't keep his feelings anymore. He, quote, gives himself up uh, to please the mother, to save the mother, to protect the mother even. Uh, and he must have the attachment, so he has no choice, really. Uh, the first priority for the child is to bond to the mother, but if she's painful, his compromise is, well, he just won't feel. And then he, that's how he deals with the pain of it. That's called repression. So all of his feelings uh, get, gets put into this unconscious bag. Robert Bly's metaphor of the unconscious, it's this bag that we drag behind us. And by the age of five, we put so much of who we are, our potential, even our pathway to the psychological birth, the pathway to individuation, the pathway to whole object relations, the capacities of the real self, so much of our gifts and given gifts that were given gets put into this bag. And then we spend the rest of our lives trying to get it back in. Now this bag, so we're calling the unconscious, or the inferring mind, because it communicates to us through inferences, and we're meant to look at our inferences, we're, we're to search for inferences, sometimes called a non-reporting brain, because it's, it's all in the brain. Yeah. So the brain sends us some information to the mind, our consciousness, that's great, but the brain would like to send more, but, it, but when it can't, that is called the non reporting brain. So the non-reporting brain um, becomes the inferring mind or the unconscious mind, but it's inferring at the same time. So this, it's communicating to us. So the metaphor, a recent metaphor we've been using is the Phantom of the Opera. So the, the singer consciously went down into the basement, symbol for the unconscious, unconscious, downstairs, unconscious, now, it's metaphysical. That character is a personification of the singer's own pain, shame, and rage. It's not an external character. It's not like that. Uh, it's just this imagined, uh, metaphysical uh, imagining to represent something we can see to, to, to recognize that the woman, the singer, has pain, shame, and rage. So she goes and communicates with this scary dude, meaning the symbol, it's a symbol, of her, of her disowned emotions and potentialities. And as she has the dialogue, um, the back and forth, or in the story, uh, uh, the singer's on the stage, she goes downstairs, talks to the guy. That's just a metaphor uh, for getting to know ourselves and accepting our pain and emotions. Then when she comes back into consciousness, after she accepts something that she lost about herself, re-owns what she lost, she's a better singer. She's a better singer. That's the whole idea of Phantom of the Opera. So the Phantom of the Opera idea is sort of a dramatization of a very common uh, motif in myths and fairy tales. So myths and fairy tales are metaphors for psychological dynamics. They're true on the inside. So a common one is uh, Cor Persephone Demeter. So uh, Demeter, uh, the protagonist, has her innocence, Cor. One day the earth opened up and Kor was abducted into the unconscious. That's a metaphor for when the baby shamed, his feelings get sucked down into the unconscious, called repression. He's not aware of it. Okay. Now, okay. so then, now, then uh, Demeter had to uh, go down, right? Uh, face the unconscious. Now, when the child loses his feelings, it's called shame. 
Now the image of shame is the burning, biting, uh, so what image do we create for this burning, biting feeling of the emotion of shame? That's the inferno, the hell scene, right? So when we face our shame, the metaphor is this, it's not a literal place, it's just a, it's just a metaphor for an emotion. Okay, so when we face shame, okay, this burning, biting feeling as shown in stories as the inferno, right? And, uh, and, uh, and a representative of this emotion of shame is the guy, the guy with the horns pulling down this core, right? So Demeter went down, core came up. Now when core came up, meaning the person accepted their lost feelings, core became Persephone. That means Demeter had a more enriched connection to her lost feelings. Right? And a lot of women around the world celebrate this character Persephone because she's uh, the image of reowning what we lost. So we, that's what psychoanalysis is all about, reowning what we lost. So bits and fairy tales, we're, we're always talking about this. That's the main, uh, that's one of the main uh, purposes of myths and fairy tales. Uh, now myths and fairy tales uh, primarily depict uh, how the, the psyche is traumatized because the main uh, motif in myths and fairy tales is the psychological pattern of splitting. Now we have a key thread, a very key thread uh, in 1001 Windmills of the Mind called the Splitting Defense. I won't go into it here, but wow, that's probably, it might be the number one most important uh, thread here. It takes a while to go through, uh, so I won't do it here. Plus, I'm having a little bit of, a, of an off day. I'm a little bit, I'm slightly under the weather, so I'm not going to really be too enthusiastic in trying to uh, try to cram in as much as I can. Sometimes I do that. Um, but, um, but anyways, in Myths and Fairy Tales, it's goddess and demon. What's going on with that? Well, what, what's happened there? Well, the baby wants to bond to the mother. If the mother's shaming, the baby projects his rage onto the mother. Now the mother's enraged. The mother's this giant. Now the giant's enraged. The baby wants to take in the loving interaction and the neural networks in relation to the loving interaction wants to incorporate her so to speak that gets denied with the shame he, when something's repressed it's projected now the now the enraged giant wants to eat him so that's uh, uh the baby thinks in pictorial thinking it's imaginal thinking so now the baby thinks his mother's a devouring monster that wants to eat him he can't accept that. He denies it, represses it. How does he relate to his mother? He hallucinates that she's a goddess. So he makes up two mothers. Uh, well, he makes up another mother. But the mother's that's a, but the mother is one person. But he thinks they're he thinks he creates two mothers. The truth he denies, they made up one he believes. That's called the splitting mechanism. So the child is quite clever to figure out some way to do this. But if it's set there, if it becomes frozen there. If by the age of three it's still being used, it may be used temporarily in the first year or so, but by three, if it's still there and it's crystallized or frozen, that's a trauma. Because splitting is not meant to continue indefinitely. That's a desperate maneuver of the mind the baby adopts when the mother's misattuned. The theory is no mother's perfect, the child might temporarily use it, briefly. But what would they? But as the child gets older, into his first year, second year, third year, and has more loving experiences, the split images come together, the mother's seen as one, and the child can handle that. The child can handle and accept that the mother is loving and frustrating at the same time. And he can hold the ambivalence. That's called holding the two sides. Every story has two sides. He can hold the two sides of the mother. He can accept that. That's assuming the love with the mother outweighs the frustration with the mother. But if that doesn't take place, and splitting is still being used because the shame outweighs the love, again, the condition for the split images to come together is that the love outweighs the shame. Then the child feels strong enough to see the two sides. But if the pain is too much, he can't see the two sides. He's just too angry. He keeps and he continues to use splitting. So if that splitting is still being used, and that's, that becomes the schema or the script or the template or the working model, etc., uh, um, then it's timeless. In the unconscious, it's timeless. That, so later on in life, they're going to have either or thinking, all or nothing thinking, this good, this uh, dichotomous thinking. Uh, you know, prejudice, of course, comes from there. 
Yeah. So one person's going to be all good and the other person's going to be all bad. They have this kind of goddess and demon template going on. It's timeless and that's why it still affects the person of the present because it's operating from the timeless world. Burglar calls the unconscious the puppet master. So this unconscious self, the second self, the secret self, the shadow self, the shadow soul, it's the one who walks. Okay. If we were to metaphysically combine all of our own disowned traits into a character, that's the double. So in the story, the student of Prague, the guy met this other guy, that other guy was him, but this other guy possessed and demonstrated all of his own disowned traits. And the idea was for him to befriend, befriend him himself, but he didn't recognize that that other person was himself. He didn't recognize it. And when he argued and fought with that other person, uh, he, he got hurt himself. So he never made the connection. And that was the moral of the story on the tombstone. It said, here's a guy who fought with himself and lost kind of thing. He didn't get it, so it was like a, a teaching tale. Uh, very well described in a little tiny book called The Double by Otto Rank. So same thing with the Phantom of the Opera. The difference there is she accepted. She wanted to know herself. She wanted to know her disowned pain and feelings. She would bring it and, and then that made her more embodied and more rich, so she became a better singer. But in the story of Student of Prague, he refused that. So that would be like the Phantom of the Opera character refusing to go downstairs to dialogue with the, with the scary dude, meaning a symbol of her pain, shame, and rage, etc. So then that's what makes her special, because she did that. Demeter, the story of Demeter, and uh, with Corn Persephone, that make, that's what makes that the founding myth for women's groups all around the world, apparently. I don't know to what degree today, but apparently a while ago it was all over the place celebration of uh, Demeter. You know, she's like Odysseus, you know, like uh, Odysseus went into the hell scene, right? Odysseus went into the underworld. You know? Guess who he saw down there? He saw his mother, okay, meaning Jocasta, how his mother used him to comfort her. Now, that, that's a symbol for him recognizing that the mother wasn't in a position to provide the love that he needed. Uh, so he felt uh, he felt wounded, and as a compensation, he he did this whole machismo act. Uh, but then his unconscious called Poseidon, the whole ocean there, the whole id, the un symbolized by Poseidon. Though it sometimes is a whole ocean in another world. It's, we live in two worlds: conscious world, unconscious world. So in, in the Odyssey, it's Poseidon. He said, "Okay, Odysseus, you you've done this macho, machismo, uh, arrogant, selfish act." for too long and uh, I've had enough. That's himself within rebelling. Now you're gonna start to feel. So then first step was, what's going on? He went in there, what's going on? He saw the mother, he saw Sisyphus. He looked at the Sisyphus's face and he saw that it was his face. He saw Agamemnon, meaning he, he recognized that he betrays himself. The mother betrayed him, then he betrays himself. And I saw mother, the mother doing this there and he can't mourn the loss. Now another one is he can't mourn the loss of his mother. He has complicated grief at the same time. So he starts, so that's, that's like the singer going into the, into the basement. Odysseus went into that underworld kind of thing. Then he came back, and now he has meaning, he understands what's going on. Now he wants to find himself, his home, Ithaca. Ithaca is his soul castle. Robert Bly says, we all live in a psychic house called a soul castle. So he's looking for this, and he had a lot of temptations to give up, right? Lotus land, and, oh, just give up, just, uh, stay in denial or something. Uh, Circe said, um, oh yeah, don't, don't, don't bother. I just, uh, you can be a playboy or machismo. And, uh, uh, the sirens did the same thing. The sirens is more graphic because the people prior to Odysseus who listened to the sirens, then they never, they never found themselves like that guy in the student of Prague. So he, he was brave. He, he said, no, no, I, I want to connect with myself. I want to feel real. I want to feel real. He wants to feel authentic in his body. He wants his soul castle. So he continued. So he tied himself to the mast or put wax in the ears or something. So he resisted it because he was aware of it. Right? So he continued on his journey, right? Uh, so Odysseus is a hero. Orestes is a hero, another good story. So a very key thread. In 1001, Windmills of the Mind is the psychology and interpretations of myths and fairy tales. I'm kind of excited about that thread. There's a lot of great material there. It's good. Uh, there's uh, 
thanks to a lot of people. Alan Chidden uh, actually helped a lot. But Robert Bly maybe sort of got it started, really, I think. And uh, yeah, a lot of John A. Sanford, uh, Robert A. Johnson, another one. Uh, I would say San John A. Sanford uh, helped a lot. Marion Woodman, a little bit by Marie Louise von Franz, a little bit there, uh, and a couple of others. And Shrinks would often make a reference to psychological patterns by quoting motifs from myths and fairy tales. So myths and fairy tales describe psychology. Myth, the motifs, a, a myth or fairy tale motif is describing a psychological pattern or a psychological dynamic, like the splitting goddess and demon. Right? Okay, uh, losing our feelings uh, and our feelings becoming repressed. The earth opened up, the, the arm yanked down Miss Core. Uh, there's an image on the front cover of one of Marion Woodman's books. You can see the, the hand yanked down the, the young lady, right? That's just a symbol for our innocence getting shamed into the unconscious, so we lost our feelings. Then the person says, who, then the person says they feel disconnected from themselves, uh, so-called depersonalization kind of feeling numb a little bit and going through the emotions of life, life is monotonous or something like that. Uh, they feel like something is missing here. It's my, my second uh, day in a row in this venue and it's been pretty good so far, yeah. I think the weather's good, most people are outside. But we may get a couple of uh, interruptions once in a while. That's okay. I was mentioning in my last video that I was I was gonna do some of these videos in a bird park. Unfortunately, a change of plans uh, it's on hold right now. But I really wanted to show you all of these beautiful birds, these tropical birds, incredible birds, uh, and talk about uh, psychodelic. <laughs> um, so we, we want to uh, re-own what we don't know about ourselves, make the unconscious conscious. So again, when something's repressed, the more misattuned the mother is, the more malattuned she is, the more we repress our feelings. The more that's repressed, the more it's projected outward. So projection is one of the key ways to understand what's within. Projection is the means bringing unconscious material to consciousness because when we project meaning attribute something about ourselves that we don't know or don't like or can't accept and we attribute it to someone else it's called projection a kind of a uh, meaning selective attention you cherry pick something or make up something outside you deny disavow something inside so your mind thinks it's outside that helps you to not feel that it's inside as beloved so below maybe so in projection uh, A person may have strong attitudes or emotions or beliefs or opinions or accusations about others. That's a mirror for them to look at to see that it's within and then and they can't accept it. And that's why they're saying it outside for them to get in touch that it's within. So Lachlan calls projection the mirror defense. So yes, when you blame others, it's a defense because you don't feel your anxiety that you would feel if you were to own it. So it squelches the anxiety. Again, all defense mechanisms are maneuvers of the mind, operations of the mind, mechanisms of the mind, tricks of the mind to help the person not feel the anxiety, to keep what they can't accept about themselves repressed, disassociated, split off, denied, compartmentalized, disavowed, whatever we say about it. We're just, we're just no longer aware of it. It's in the unconscious. It's in the non-reporting brain somewhere. But it's influencing us. It's powerful. It's the puppet master in our lives, right? So it can, it can get us to think and believe things that we don't know why we think or believe these things. And it's powerful. And then our conscious, it shuts down our conscious reasoning sometimes too. It, it's very, uh, the emotionality is quite strong in there. If you look at the painting called Stepping Out by Roy Lichtenstein, Stepping Out, you can see the, you get a little a glimpse of that. 
Okay, so um, so so that's one of the ways we make the unconscious conscious, so-called owning our projections. Sometimes called shadow work because it's from the shadow self. Right? The shadow is trying to get our attention. The shadow is trying to seek reintegration into the person. The shadow is a part of the person, but we're denying it. Just like narcissist denied echo, his true feeling, his true self. Pierre Gin denied Solvig, same idea, and so on. Uh, the student of Prague guy denied, actually was hostile towards his own shadow, so he was hurt by it. We want to accept what we don't know about ourselves. We want to welcome back in what we lost. It's like your own wounded inner child. You, you want to you want to love back your own inner wounded child. Your, your, you as a child were wounded. It's, the memories are there. You want to kind of hold and accept, welcome back, welcome home yourself, welcome yourself home. You need your feeling self. Your inner child of the past is coming back. So that's the attitude you want to have. Imagine it's like your lost, your baby was lost and it's wounded, and you finally found them. You would be very accepting, and that's the attitude you want to have for yourself. When you, you want to bring back uh, what we lost about ourselves. Um, so one way, of, one so this innate drive for healing. So the positive intention of projection is that it creates this mirror, like Lachlan says. So yes, it worked to keep you unaware. At the same time, it created a mirror. You're meant to look at the mirror, meaning notice what you're saying and then ask yourself how does it belong to me how am I like that am I talking about myself is it confession is this my psyche's way to get me to be aware of myself what I'm saying about others now we recently added a twist to this I think we can do two things I, I, I very much agree with uh, Morton uh, Kisan he says you can do two things actually with projection you're blaming and your accusations and your judgments about others. So you can first ask yourself, yeah, how, how does that belong to me? He says, actually, direct your emotions and your attitudes towards your parents. We often displace our true feelings for our parents onto others because we're protecting our parents. So one way to have the one way for the baby to have the connection with the mother is that he had to sacrifice himself, right? So he protected the parent. He, he did what the parent wanted, meaning the baby recognized that the mother was uncomfortable with his feelings and needs, so he gave them up. So he protected the parent. Now to continue, that's frozen. That's a crystallized, timeless, right? So in the present, in the unconscious, it's timeless. So they're gonna continuously protect the parent so they're gonna blame others and that protects the parent because they cannot express their true feelings towards the parent because the parent uh, the baby thinks the parent would abandon them or something the, the baby's too stressed out already he can't fight back against his mother who's objecting him right. Oops. I didn't even notice they were there Well, if, they, if they listened in, they can have a free, they can have a free lecture, <laughs> a free lecture uh, on uh, uh, on uh, psychological uh, concepts. Uh, my disclaimer again: I'm not a shrinker, a therapist, or a professor, or a social worker, or a doctor, or a nutritionist. None of these things. Um, I'm the compiler of the quotes. I like discussing them so that I can learn about them uh, for myself as well i love sharing it and uh uh there's a lot of great quotes here uh and i feel immense hope myself by it so let's let's go back to uh morton uh, kiss kissen actually he has one uh chapters eight and nine as a unit uh from his book affect object and character structure those two chapters as a unit has won the Golden Windmills of the Mind Award. The most recent one, by the way, the 21st Golden Windmills of the Mind Award for that, for that, just that very concept. He says, when the baby's trying to bond to the mother and the mother is stressed out and unavailable, the child thinks, what does what, what he got to do to have the connection? That's the primary thing. The child has to bond. 
no baby can make it on their own without the mother. So he's got to bond to the mother somehow. Now if the child senses that the mother is uncomfortable with the baby's feelings and wishes, he gives himself up. So he protected the mother. He helped the mother. He's trying to take care of the mother in a sense. Okay, stencil, schema. That's a highly emotional event uh, that becomes frozen. Like, like the, the woolly mammoth in the ice block. It just stuck there, frozen there. Something like that, right? Um, and it's timeless, right? 30,000 years, is it? Was it Yucca or something from Siberia? The, the woolly mammoth was frozen there. It's just like timeless. So there's something stuck there when, when a strong emotional event takes place like that. So the child makes a schema, a script, a traumatic script. This function is the repetition of a traumatic script. Traumatic scripts means they're going to be repeated over and over again in this timelessness, from the from the energy of the timelessness perspective. Right? It's going to be repeated over and over again. Trauma and repetition compulsion are the same. They're synonymous, basically. Russell says. Think of them as synonymous. He says. Okay. So the so the child gave himself up, sacrificed his golden ball. His feelings, his Ithaca, his Penelope, his potential. Now, he had true feelings of anger towards the mother. He put him in the bag because he's got to protect the mother. Mother, you're not happy with my feelings and needs? Oh, really? Oh, my God. Oh, that's awful. Oh, so he'll give himself up. Now the mother maybe is more tolerant of the child. So that's the best attachment they can have somehow. Stencil. So the rest of you know, for the rest of their lives, they're going to protect the mother. That's the script. That's the schema. The schematic, right? The, schema. the architect needs schematic drawings. So that's to make his buildings. For his so the person for their lives, they're going to look at the schematic drawings they drew. So we're our own accidental architects. We created these schematic drawings for our lives, and we're always referring to it over and over again, like like the record metaphor by burglar. So the schematic drawing or the schema is that, okay, uh, don't express your emotions toward the true source. Don't express your wishes and needs toward the true source. Keep it repressed and redirect them to others. And that's how you protect uh, the parent. So projection is protect protecting the parent. Blaming someone else means you're protecting the parent. So Morton says, every time you're projecting, redirected towards the parent I think that placard is probably the best one of the best placards uh, I've ever seen is uh, that woman who hold that placard uh, against some kind of a some kind of event there unfortunate type of event her slogan her placard said if you have a problem with your identity take it up with your parents because she was she was being unfairly blamed for something by the people with the prejudiced mind um, and she says don't blame us you got a problem take it up with your parents you but those people at the so-called kind of a prejudice rally or something um, they're protecting their parents so all of those people are saying look parents so they're following the scheme the schema so the schema says don't tr direct your true emotions towards your parents that was the schema. That's what the baby created. That's what the person, as a baby, drew in their mind with the neural networks, the schema. So the placard was, be conscious now. If you have a problem with, <laughs> with knowing yourself, take it up with your parents. Stop blaming. Stop protecting your parents. The, the baby protected someone who hurt them. It has been pretty good here. I can't. This is the quietest. Oh my God. Well, this is a, a real ironic uh, twist of events here because I've been having a hard time making these videos in public places. Lots, lots of distractions. And now the peak season is just starting to kick in. Oh, the tourists are everywhere. It's flocking everywhere. Uh, and I, ironically, uh, this little lobby here is kind of quiet. Okay, that's a key point. Uh, TQ2191 and uh, 2. TQ, TQs 2191 and uh, 2192. Uh, six hour discussion around it. Just, just to 
discuss this idea that when you're blaming someone else, your friend, your partner, your, your mate, whatever, even someone, your, an acquaintance even, someone you don't even know even, someone you just, just met or something, and you have these strong attitudes and angry feelings towards some trifle. Okay, it's meant for your parent. Now the reason you're doing it to the innocent other is because you're still protecting the parent because you're operating out of that schema, that schematic that was drawn down on. Again, the schematic is frozen there like the woolly mammoth is frozen in the ice of block. It's just frozen there. We want to dethaw the ice and maybe get the poor, poor, poor animal walking around again. It's just a giant elephant. <laughs> Uh, the reason I'm talking about the woolly mammoth is because I just came across a quote. Uh, so what do we do it now about that one? Um, 20, 20, uh, 135. What is particularly characteristic of the, of the psychoanalytic perspective? What is particularly characteristic of the psychoanalytic perspective is its emphasis on the persisting influence of certain childhood wishes and fears despite later experiences that might be expected to alter them well, okay that's that's the power of the template the child had these wishes and fears it's, it's a template later on some good things happen it doesn't register because later on nobody is the breast mother so it doesn't, or maybe he has a symbolic good experience that was kind of caring. It doesn't change his psychic structure, it doesn't change the script. Uh, maybe he has a, felt better in the moment or something, but it didn't change anything. So that's the power of the script. So his metaphor is that this is the timeless unconscious at work. The timeless unconscious at work, or as uh, Paul Watchell calls it, the woolly mammoth view. Meaning, once trapped in ice, okay, so that's uh, frozen there, once something's frozen, it stays perfectly preserved forever. Right? Unless, we, unless we thaw it out. So yeah, a couple of videos ago we talked about schemas. There's stencils, there's scripts, and the reason they're so powerful because it's pain and it's unconscious. So it, we want to not feel that unconscious psychic pain, emotional pain. So re replaying the event in the present, something to make us think it's the past, to, to change the past, but it can't be done. It's Sisyphus. The boulder rolls down the hill. It doesn't work. That nursery time, the first three years, was a one-time deal. You can't still try to rework it like that. You can have 20 lifetimes trying to re rework it, redo it. It doesn't work. The goal is to observe it and then uh, talk about it and then mourn the loss, accept the situation. And then as we get our feelings through the mourning process, we start to get our identity. I feel, therefore, I am. Then we can start to differentiate, know ourselves, and and dethaw, uh, dethaw the ice, and let and free the woolly mammoth kind of thing, right? free our feelings. Right? So back to projection. Um, one of my favorite quotes on projection is a, a very folksy one from a, a philosopher from. 2,500, uh, 2,500 years ago, Confucius said uh, to his students once, apparently, quote, when I'm in a party of three, I always have two teachers. To the one I admire, I study him and learn from him and be a student. To the one I don't like so much, to the one I see traits that I don't like, I look for those traits in myself. So that's already a recognition of a projection. You're in a party of three. One person, you, th you think this and that about them. Well, search for those traits in yourself. Know, know yourself, right? That's, that's just because you're projecting onto them. Whether or not they have it to some degree or not, that's whatever. That's their, you know. 
the idea is to own what we're projecting, to become more connected to ourselves. Um, so, yeah, so we can do... I think it's a very good self-help exercise. I don't think anybody's mentioned this. We can do three things now. When you're triggered by something and you're blaming the person, you're blaming the... So the trigger's just a trifle, right? Uh, you, yeah, you try to say hello to someone. Or even a simple little, you try to say hello to someone and they just ignored you or walked away. And then you think, how can they be so cold and rejecting and you, you go on you're, you're ang so angry about that person oh my god it's just a harmless trifle they were just doing their they were busy they're they afraid they're not interested in a rush they it's fine right they have their right to and then you're but you're directing a lot of this emotion to that person saying how could they be so cold and rejecting okay pause you can do three things direct that to, to the parent which parent was cold and rejecting okay now you're going now you're getting somewhere you direct it to, towards the parent that's number one. Number two, you can ask yourself, how am I cold and rejecting myself sometimes? Right? Maybe I do that sometimes, slight people or something. Okay, number three, uh, you do both. Right? So I think that's not a bad little self-help exercise, right? Uh, and what can facilitate it is the five-word question prompt. Uh, what's the hardest thing about, and you fill in the blank. So, so let, let's, let's, let's try with that example. The person uh, didn't uh, want to befriend you or something. Didn't even, right? So you, you uh, so what's the hardest thing about uh, the person not showing interest uh, in my interest or something? So the per well, okay. Or oh, the pain, there's the pain. So what's the hardest thing about the pain you're feeling? Well, I don't want to feel this pain. Okay, go on. Um, so what, okay, now you think it's a trigger. So that's, so okay, go on. Well, um, so what did you, so that's a trigger. So, okay, then you go into the trigger, right? So the person was triggered. So uh, as a child, the person had a need in the way, the person had a need for connection, it didn't get met, and he was angry. So now he, uses the slight by this stranger to recognize that the person himself as a child had a need for connection didn't get met and he's angry so the anger is towards the parent but, at the, but remember the schematic the schematic drawing in the mind says protect the parent protect the parent don't direct your anger towards the parent so you just detach the emotion that's meant for the parent and redirect it to somewhere else it's called displacement Displacement. We'll add one more quote to our thread on displacement here. TQ, um, yeah, it's coming up here. TQ uh, 2333. Uh, 20, uh, 2133. Why don't we just jump into displacement then? Okay, so the person's triggered. He's blaming the innocent person over, the, over a trifle. He's protecting the parent. So let's let's uh, add this one. So yesterday we did a good quote on displacement. So we'll add one more as well here. Okay, displacement is a process by which one idea may surrender to another the whole volume of its emotionality, meaning emotional connection, life force, bonding connection, right? So, 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 so when the baby has his life force and he attaches to the mother, that's called cathexis, that connection, that glue there, it's cathexis, it's like a gluing there of the life force to the object or to the person. So the baby cathex to the mother, put it that way, right? And when the, ba when the nursing is complete, uh, the baby can decathect and now he has uh, latitude, he has freedom, right? But he first needs to cathect, get the love, and then he can leave her, right? But if the but if there's a problem there, he didn't have a good attachment with others. He's seeking it. He's seeking that kind of attachment with others. It's triggered. Now the baby wanted to bond to the mother. If that got broken, he's enraged. It's in the unconscious. He's going to try to master that. He's going to replay that. So he'll find someone else, try to have that kind of intimate bond. But no one can be the breast mother for them. 
They said no, thank you. They walked away, whatever. And now you're now you're brought up. Now you're now you're feeling the feelings what you felt at, towards your mother. It's come up now. It's triggered up. Right? Now, so you want to direct it to the parent. Right? So displacement. Okay, so displacement is a process by which one idea may surrender to another the whole volume of its cathexis. This dynamism uh, was first discovered in the study of dreams. Okay, so we did a good quote yesterday's video on dreams, right? And then was found to be a dominant characteristic in the obsessional neuroses, where there is displacement of affect from that which is actually important to a triviality which may thus take on the coloring of great and urgent significance. Right. Another way of saying it is there's a kind of mistaken association. The substitute idea is suitable in some way or another for the displacing process, but only through superficial unconscious carrying over of some idea. So the person wanted to befriend somebody Maybe they had some slight resemblance to the parent or something. Or maybe they had a, they possessed a quality that they needed from the parent. Just some slight superficial thing. And then they transfer all of their emotions onto that person. Right? That's displacement. Right? So displacement is protecting the parent. Projection is protect, protecting the parent. All of these things. Uh, again, 2191. 92 and 93. That's one of the most helpful self-help exercises, 2193, based on the work of 91 and 90, 21, 91 and 92. I think I've got my numbers wrong here. Hold on a sec. Why are we saying 21? Where are we here? Hold on a sec. 23, not 21. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Make a few little mistakes here. So these are 23s. Okay. So in this video, we're going to be doing 2331 uh, to uh, 2336. Okay. Now, most of these quotes today, uh, 31, 2, 3, and 4. So we're going to do six quotes today. The first four come from the same book from yesterday's video. So I just discovered a very good book. 1930. Oh my God. Written in 1930. Uh, this guy, William Healy, and his uh, helpers there, uh, put together a kind of Cole's Notes of psychoanalysis as it was understood up, up until the age of, uh, up until the year of 1930. It's very good. A lot of it's this old stuff, so you can admit that. But there are parts of it that are still quite good. So yesterday's video had some very good material uh, from this book called uh, The Structure and Meaning of Psychoanalysis by Healy, Bonner, and Bowers. So this video is a continuation. I couldn't fit it all in. So this video, yeah. So we're going to continue from the last video, basically. But the last video had the best quotes. Uh, these are sort of also good. Uh, so we're going to include them as well here. So let's uh, let's let's uh, just begin here with a projection. I think it's worth it's worth repeating as many times as possible. I, maybe I unconsciously want to be heard, so I'm I'm, us I'm using the importance of this quote in my unconscious wish to be heard. Yeah. You're triggered, you're angry, you have thoughts towards somebody in the present, whoever it is, your spouse, your friend, your co-worker, a colleague, same thing, right, uh, etc. Just for a minute, all of that material, see how it relates to the parent. See how the person in the present is just basically a proxy holder for what's meant for the parent and just retransferred back to its true source to the parent, you'll feel a huge relief by that. 
That's number one. Number two, your accusations about others regarded as a confession for what's within. Projection is confession. Prejudice is confession. Number two, that's second activity. Number three, do both. Number four, uh, as an intro, try the five words uh, prompt. What's the hardest thing about what I'm feeling or experiencing or thinking about this? And then that, and then that starts to lead to the I statement, meaning when you were in a child in the past, you had a need. I then name the need and the feelings around how you felt when you didn't get that need met. Okay, so there's actually five little parts there. So five little self-help exercises can be uh, put together. So we'll update that. I'm just uh, experimenting here. So we'll update that for a future. So why don't we just tentatively say this. The five words, prompt. So if you're triggered, start off with the five words prompt. What's the hardest thing about whatever it is you're going through? Right? Something happened and if you're upset about it, what's the hardest thing about this event that's upsetting? And you talk about it, you free associate. Okay, that's, that's number two, the, the I statement. Recall that what you're feeling now is a trigger, so when you're in the past, you had a need, name the need that you had as a child, and how you felt when that need didn't get met. Okay, so that's the, that's the I statement part. Okay. And then what we just said, so the third step is uh, direct your emotions and thoughts towards the parent then to, and then towards yourself and maybe there's a blurring there, that's the five. So we'll work on that, that's, that's a rough one, yeah. So back to projection. We must have over, well over 100 quotes on projection. Uh, so we'll add one more uh, quote to our thread on projection here. Okay, projection. The ego, the mind, right, thrusts forth, attributes to others, onto the external world, unconscious wishes and ideas, which, if allowed to penetrate into consciousness, would be painful to the person. Okay, Franz Alexander sp speaks of the important part played by the ego in the process of projection. The ego yields to the id, to the point of falsifying perceptions of the real world and of reshaping reality in harmony with id tendencies. Okay, again, just keep this, this was written in 1930, so just keep that in mind. So the mind is gonna cooperate with the emotion, with the emotional uh, feelings going on in the bag, right? So our conscious mind is actually going to be co-opted by the puppet master. So our mind is going to distort according to what the puppet master is telling us to distort. Well, don't see them as this or that. See them that way to fit the traumatic script. So the ego is cooperating. The ego yields to the it. That's what he means. So all of that energy in the bag, right? sometimes it's called the it, right? Projection thus resembles uh, the process uh, uh, the same process in, in the paranoid process. So he's just comparing it to the process. He's not saying it's, he's not saying, he's not comparing it to the paranoid phenomena. He's just saying the process of paranoia. He says there's a little resemblance there. So the paranoia guy thinks this person is, has these intentions. He's talking about within, he has all of these, all of these anger and Maybe he doesn't know how to protect his mother. Yeah. We have a quote coming up in the next video. We don't have a thread on crime, but uh, uh, I might start it. I might start this thread. So with this quote coming up, uh, actually from the same author here, uh, Healy and Alexander, they said that uh, uh, that this juvenile uh, delinquent kind of guy, he. Uh, yeah, he, he, the, the older brother got all of the attention and he was the rejected one. So the older brother was the idealized one and he was the shamed, unloved one. So the parents were using splitting. The parents were using splitting on their children. One child good, one child no good. So that no good child, how does he protect his parent? How does he connect with his parent? So he was a 
he was a juvenile delinquent, and that was uh, an angry attempt to get something symbolic from others, get to get something from others that would be symbolic of the parents. And he's expressing his anger at his parents, showing them up, trying to embarrass the parents. So he's angry at his parents, showing them up by his rude behavior, and he's trying to get something from them. Um, so he would say that others, um, and then he would rationalize it by saying, well, others are so ill-intended. Ill Put it this way, I guess, I guess what he's saying here is it's a question of degree on a spectrum. Projection can be very mild, you know, uh, for example, the husband uh, has fallen and out, of, out of love with his wife, but he doesn't want to admit it, it's embarrassing, he feels like he's going to break in the deal and his, with the family, so he wants to communicate that he has fallen out of love with his wife. So he just strongly says, hey, wife, uh, I think you've fallen out of love with me. That's a projection. So that's sort of like on the mild end. There's no paranoia there. But in the paranoia, it would be the more extreme one. right? So that's what he means by the parallel process. We're not talking about the degree here, just comparing the process. Something within, you can't admit it, so you say it's without, outside, right? So the guy fell out of love with his wife. He doesn't want to admit it. He creates a mirror to keep it denied. He says his wife has fallen out of love with him. Uh, and she doesn't know what you're talking about, but he, but he insists it uh, to keep it denied. Now him insisting this is a mirror for him to see that he has fallen out of love with his wife, that kind of thing. So that's one way, that's one example of projection. Right? Uh, so the paranoid guy thinks uh, whatever he thinks, that means that's within him, that's that angry teenager who wasn't loved and rejected by the parents. He's enraged and sees the rejecting parents onto others, those kinds of things. That's going to be a tough thread tomorrow if I, if I start this quote, if I begin with that quote, because that's an area I, I really don't want to get into. 1001 Windmills of the Mind is really just on the, the mild neurotic, the moderate neurotic, maybe partially the highly neurotic with the bully pattern. A sort of, but the more on the more extreme ends, I don't really go there. I'm not a doctor, so I don't really go there. But sometimes a quote comes along that's very interesting. Yeah, so that crime one, burglar says, what connection can the person have to the parent to protect? They want to protect the parent. They want to have a connection to the parent. So he's, he calls it that crime is an attempt to have a parent to protect. It, it takes a long way to get to that idea, but ultimately, that's, that's what he was saying, I think. Okay, let, let's save that for tomorrow. Um, okay, back to uh, projection here. Okay, um, so projection. Uh, he says it's, a, it's a, a disavowal or a falsification of inner and external reality. Okay, the child, while relinquishing his own power, powerfulness, projects it upon others. I guess my first thought was the hero idol worship, or the hero, or the hero worship. The little, the little kid says, "No, Batman is the strongest superhero." The other, his friend says, "No, Superman is the strongest superhero." So they lost their narcissism. They lost their infantile megalomania. They may project that on to the character. So the child secretly still has that kind of a feeling of him being like a little king, god, powerful, right? All ba the theory, yeah? all babies think they're little gods, they're powerful beings, right? Everything is there to serve them, everything is taken care of for them. In the womb, the placenta takes care of everything, feeds them unconditionally. And during the nursing, same kind of thing. So the theory is the baby thinks he's a little god called infantile megalomania. Now, if he's stuck there to one degree or another, later on, he may project his infantile megalomania onto uh, sports celebrities and rock stars and these kinds of things. Uh, so, yeah, kids will do that, right? They, they might say, you know, uh, 
the best guitarist is, uh, you know, Rick Emmett. No, the best guitarist is Bruce Coburn, or whatever it is, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, and then, of course, we feel safe, right? If a person strongly says they're the best, uh, and they unconsciously link themselves to that person, they get a little serotonin because the superhero, uh, the, the football star or whatever, is in a high position. He's in a one-up position. He has status, the money, and admired and all that. And he relates himself to him. Uh, he feels a little like identified with them somehow. So he gets a little serotonin through the fantasy. So through fantasy, we can get serotonin. Now, if the psychic structure is that they still have the primary narcissism there, they may constantly have this fantasy of being, uh, you know, in some kind of a, they may constantly fantasize they're a rock star, that kind of thing. Right? Um, yeah, we'll have to follow up on that one, how child pro uh, project their loss of uh, power, power onto others. Okay. The doubt of another person's love may easily be a projection of the individual's own unconscious doubt of his love for that person. So that's the example I just gave, right? Okay, next one. A conscious pr protective thought or fantasy regarding another, which... A projective, huh? A conscious projective thought or fantasy regarding another, which acts as a cloak. Okay, it's a cloak. Projection is a cloak for unconscious thoughts which are anxious to escape criticism and consciousness. Means keep it repressed. We can't accept this about ourselves. We want to keep it repressed. So it's anxious to avoid consciousness. So projection is this cover cloak. Right? So one quote is uh, Mopey projection. You see a trifle that's true about yourself onto the other person. It's a trifle. It functions like a hook. Then you hang your coat on it. We have a threat of projective identification, which is an extension of projection, which we won't do, but it's a very important threat. So projection is an e-booklet. Projective identification is an e-booklet. Displacement as well. Okay, reaction formation is sort of, we're still in the early phases of reaction formation. The key idea here is it's sometimes called reversal formation. Something you can't admit about yourself, it's too embarrassing to admit. To stay in touch with it, you express it consciously through its reversal. So the reversal has a link to the rever back to the, the source. So the source is the person has an unconscious wish for, or maybe has a memory of has an unconscious wish for something he's embarrassed about let's say so he consciously says how bad the very thing he wants to do is so and he and he may believe it he consciously thinks right? so there was that woman who wanted to be a good mother so one example we had the woman wanted to be a good mother she loved her child but things went wrong and she didn't know what she, she was doing finally she started to hit the child and then she wanted to cloak it over with the rationalization. And then she became an advertiser saying, uh, no, uh, corporal punishment is good, you gotta... And then, and then she believed it. But the truth was, she loved the child, but it was too painful because she didn't know how to love the child. So she did the... So when she did the reverse, uh, then she, then she uh, cloaked it over with the rationalization. Then she consciously believes that punishing the child is right. That's a reaction formation. She hates it. The truth is she hates it. The truth is she loves the child, but she says the opposite. So it's something like that, right? Um, that's a tough one. This reaction formation, all throughout this series, whenever a quote comes along on reaction formation, I find myself really stuttering here. Okay, let's try Let's see how we do with this one here, 2332. Reaction formation, sometimes called reversal formation, is the development in the ego of conscious, socialized attitudes, and interests which are the antithesis of certain infantile wishes which continue to persist 
in the frozen, timeless unconscious. In moderation, reaction formation uh, tends uh, to have a social value. Uh, typo there. In moderation, reaction formation tends to have a social value. But in regard to personality formation trends, it must be remembered that the ego alteration is, after all, only a seeming one, serving to conceal underlying opposites, which may have played a much larger role in the development than is apparent on the surface. To distinguish between personality characteristics which are the result of reaction formation and those which follow sublimation, it is obviously important not to misinterpret estimable, estimable Estimable, estimable behavior trends such as philanthropy or a strong love of justice, etc., which in some cases are genuine uh, sublimation, uh, um, but which in other cases may indicate exactly the opposite underlying tendencies. Where there is sublimation, there is a resolution of conflicts. In reaction formation, this is not the case. So let's say the guy is uh, involved uh, in some kind of charity or something, but he's doing it as a reaction formation. It doesn't heal him. It won't heal him. It's useful to society, of course. It's helpful to society. And he believes it's important to, to give to charity and all this, but maybe unconsciously, uh, he has opposite feelings. Other people who give to charity, uh, it's more genuine and it's a chance to express their love and concern for others. So that's genuine sublimation, transfer of their emotions towards something useful. Right? So the point here is that uh, uh, reaction formation uh, is usually uh, useful to society. And how do we, how do we uh, tell the difference between when something is useful to society due to reaction formation and when something is useful to society due to just general uh, channeling of our energies, sublimation. Yeah. And, if a, and with regard to personality traits, I say a person has a personality trait. Could it be just a continuous expression of reaction formation? Maybe the person is a pleaser all the time. Maybe unconsciously he hates uh, uh, the people he's constantly pleasing. That's, that, that, so maybe his personality is, is, has that trait. But something like that. So a little clarity there on this quote. Yeah, we did displacement already, so I won't redo it here. Okay, next uh, next one here is. Um, Oh, the birth trauma one. Oh, let me take a little stretch here with the birth trauma one. Hold on a sec. Let me, let me take a sip of my ton ex overpriced tourist coffee here. In yesterday's video, uh, I read that uh, this Healy guy, he personally financed a lot of projects that, that put this book here and other book and other works out of his own pocket, went to great expense. And uh, he had one quote where about a woman who uh, uh, was very angry uh, at his mother. Uh, so yeah, a uh, daughter was very angry at his mother, but she has to protect her for the attachment. In order, so she displaced her anger onto the father. That, that means she's protecting the mother. So the father got all of the heat, right? That's number one. So, the, so she was angry at the father. Um, it's a displacement at the, toward the mother. Right? Now the, the rage the baby feels, uh, that's caused by the mother in the very beginning, at the, in, during the nursing. 
Right? The fathers later on don't cause that kind of primal fear like that, right? But she, but the daughter will, but she transferred that kind of primal feel to, to the father. So she hated the father for, uh, to protect the mother. So she's transferring the true feelings towards the mother to the father. So there's an example of displacement. Right? Now, that's part. That's part one. That's that's a part a. Part B was she, the daughter wasn't getting her needs met from the mother. So now she trans. Now she displaced her needs onto the father. But the poor father can't. Breastfeed, he can't do it. He, he's, he's not the mother. He can't do these things. So it's, but she's expecting it. The, the daughter is desperate to get the love she needs, and she's transferred it onto the father. The father can't do it. So now she's more enraged because she thought the father was like the last hope kind of thing. So that's part B. Now she hates the father even more. Now part C is why didn't the father step in and help the mother calm down to provide the love for the daughter? So he didn't do that. So he was a, he was a passive compliant to the mother's shaming of the daughter. Now she's triply enraged at the father. So this, this uh, in yesterday's video, we talked about it a fair bit. She was three times enraged at the father. Right? Um, one is the displacement to protect the mother. Two, it's the impossibility of the father providing the nursing that's, that's rage there. And number three, the father is a little guilty for number three because he could have done something. Right? Fathers just stand back, a mother knows best, so he's kind of like a passive one in that area. But by and large, all of this rage towards the father is, is, is right? The father's shaking his head, well, what's going on here, right? Uh, so we had that quote where the woman grew up with that template, frozen in time, the woolly mat stuck there, it's a stencil, timeless, the timeless. So in the present, the timeless past is carried in the present and it's taking over the present. Right? So the timeless past is taking over the present. Now she hates all men because she transferred, uh, every man reminds her of the father that she hates. So this woman, uh, to feel superior and to express her revenge on the man, she married a husband she could henpeck and peck at him and express and always keep him waiting and do these things. Right? So. Uh, that was from the Healy quote from yesterday. And I thought to show my appreciation to William Healy here, I remember that we have one song in our soundtrack, 1001, Wind Mills of the Mind soundtrack, which uh, I think we, if memory serves, we did play once very early on, about two years ago. So I thought we'll play it again here. And, it's, and I noticed that in the song, there's a little bit of a reference to this. The protagonist in the song you're gonna hear says, I'm this weak guy. How can you accept me? What did I do to win your love? Well, the answer is, she just, she likes inferior men, so she can stay superior. If she stays superior, she can shame the guy. Now, this poor guy felt like, well, here's a beautiful girl, intelligent girl, why she's choosing this uneducated guy or whatever it is. I'm, I'm talking about the song, not the singer, right? I'm talking about the contents of the song. I have no idea about the singer in that, in that regard. Um, so why don't we just play that song here? Um, so uh, thank you uh, William Healy that's a very good book you wrote um, who knows may, maybe you're related to Jeff Healy um, so we only have one of his songs uh, he's sort of like a one-hit wonder kind of guy so I think this was his uh, one uh, big hit back in the 80s or something so it's called Angel Eyes so let's, let's take a little break here
I guess his second minor hit. That was his big one, big hit there, Angel Eyes. He's got another song that was a minor hit called uh, about a con man, about a Don Juan kind of guy. Uh, so that's a yeah, interesting song about a liar, or a con man, or something. And he says he's not gonna fall for it. You're you're a con woman, a con man, or something. That's not a bad song. Maybe yeah, we'll play it. Yeah, maybe we should play it. Uh, we'll, maybe we'll play that one day. If we do, if we do the thread on the crime, maybe we'll play that song. So he's um, yeah. So two Healy's there, Jeff Healy and William Healy. Uh, okay, the birth trauma one. Okay, I, I did talk. We did. We do have a thread on birth trauma. Difficult topic. Like wow. Like what a topic. I did spend some time in the last video on birth trauma, so we'll just add a little bit. Uh, more to it. This sort of describes the general uh, milieu of birth trauma, I guess. Okay, uh, so a little bit on birth trauma. The satisfaction of intrauterine existence. Okay, so before I forget, if the child has prenatal trauma, okay. The image of that is Mr. Dis in Dante's Divine Comedy, because the baby in the womb, his first object, his first cathexis, his first attachment is to the cord and the placenta. Of course, the environment's part of it as well, but we're just saying to keep it simple that the cord and the placenta is the, ch is the child's first object, mother, let's say, right? The cord and the placenta connected to the mother, but he thinks the mother's an extension of him. It's all blurred there. It's just he's a little... So just as a, an approximation, the most important thing to the baby is the cord and the placenta, right? Now, if he's stressed out, the cord has three veins, three long, long veins, okay? And he's intimately in constant interaction with this cord, right? Now, if he's stressed out in the womb, the, the imagining that the baby makes in his little brain is that he's relating to the, the Mr. Dis in Divine's comedy, this Loch Ness monster with three long necks, the body and the three long necks, this monster. So the baby creates an image of, the, of his own cord and the placenta as this scary monster. Now, in the Odyssey, we saw this. We saw in the Odyssey, uh, the ship there, this monster with three long necks was eating the people. Right? Uh, so that's maybe facing prenatal distress syndrome. One person says maybe it is about the birth canal uh, and uh, the oxygen between a, ro a hard rock and a hard, uh, what is it again, Sicilia and... Uh, what is it, Charbelis and Sicilia? There may be one interpretation is it's, that's facing the, the challenging canal of the birth. If he stays in, he can't breathe. If he if he's going to be born, there's oxygen problems. If he stays in, there's a problem. So the the rock between the rock and the hard place is, if he's going to be born, he's facing the fear of, of the pain of the birth. Or if he stays in, it's the pain of staying. So he's in this. He's got a very difficult navigation there. He's got to navigate. Remember, in the Odyssey, he has to navigate between those two dangerous places, the whirlpool, the swirling of the, the, the all of the, the fluids if he's stuck within, um, and the hard place, maybe it's gonna like a hard landing when he's, when he's born, it's gonna, like a, it's gonna be a shock trauma when he's birthed, that's the hard place, maybe if he stays in, he's traumatized by the whirlpool. So it's an interesting one, and, and, and surrounding him was the three, uh, was Mr. Dis there, the, mon the Loch Ness monster with the three long necks, that's the prenatal distress syndrome, makes him vulnerable to birth trauma, you know. But that's, that's, uh, that's uh, one, one, one theory, right? So let's go back to the Garden of Eden. But most of the time, the time in the womb is the Garden of Eden. Oceanic feeling, oceanic bliss, ocean, unico mystica, the child's in heaven. He, he's, uh, uh, he's in this blissful, happy state, floating around, smiling. Wow, this is cool, you know like the person on the water mattress in a beautiful uh, uh, lagoon there. Oh, it's very nice and peaceful kind of thing, right? So the satisfaction, the satisfaction, the Garden of Eden, the satisfaction of intrauterine existence. Okay, that's called, that's called a welcoming womb. He's in a welcoming womb. The womb is welcoming. He, it's welcoming him. It's soothing him. It's, he feels safe within. That's the satisfaction of intrauterine existence. 
and the rude awakening, the rude destruction of this blissful state by the process of birth okay, have both been emphasized in some quarters as more significant than any other childhood experience for future healthy traumatic uh, neurotic development. Okay, so some people believe that these two items, the satisfaction within the Garden of Eden, that's one item, and the, the shock of the rude interruption from this blissful Garden of Eden, and suddenly the shock of this, the proceeding, hospital procedures, the forceps, the, the bright lights, and the, uh, and the maybe he was removed when he wasn't ready to be removed, maybe there was a, all of these emergency procedures, and this shock took place. So there's two parts there. Some people believe that this stencil that's created during that time, that that's the most important schema that's taking place. So the main protagonist, the great protagonist of birth trauma theory is Otto Rank. I'm very open-minded to what Otto Rank is saying because of that little book called The Double. He's very, credi he's very credible in that book, uh, The Double. I haven't read his book, The Birth Theory. That's a, that's a lot of work to read through that. But um, again, the satisfaction of intrauterine existence and the rude destruction of this peaceful state by the process of birth have both been emphasized in some quarters as more significant than any other childhood experience for future healthy or neurotic development. So if the birth was smooth, he's going to have healthy development. If he's shock traumatized at birth, he's going to be neurotic somehow. I don't recall if, if, if we have a quote. I'm not sure if I've posted it yet. I'll double check, but we, from the TV show Route 66. Uh, what are their names again? Anyways, in the 60s... Uh, road uh, road uh, show uh, road trip show called route 66 the two guys in the car uh, talking about philosophy sometimes and uh, one guy what's his name again was a but I think it was was a buzz Todd and buzz or something one of them anyways one of the two guys said to the other that um, oh no one of the guys was saying to comfort someone else they said you know, we're all, um, we're all survivors, he said, right from birth. He said, like, we're, we're wounded right from birth. And the rest of our lives, we're trying to heal from birth, the shock of birth trauma. And he says, we're all vets, he says. He said, we're all uh, in this battle to uh, recover from what happened to us. So he had, he had this dramatic uh, metaphor that birth trauma is like a shock trauma, you know. Uh, so he... So Otto Rank uh, believes this very much and wrote a, a mammoth book about it. Um, okay. The great protagonist, the great protagonist um, of the birth trauma theory is Otto Rank, who claims that prenatal experience is normally supremely pleasurable. Okay, that's the Garden of Eden and the experience of birth, a tremendous psychic shock, right? So he emphasizes this, uh, this transition from bliss to the shock trauma of birth. With birth, there comes not only a cataclysmic change, both in environment and modes of functioning, i.e. change of temperature, the bright lights, the noises, the handling by the adults. Okay, the handling. This is uh, the handling. Some of the people who deliver the baby, they just rough handle the baby. Oh, I put them out, remove the cord, put them on the scale, wrap the towel around them. Uh, they, the handling is rough. Uh, that that that's uh, what it, compared to the blissful state he was in before. There was this rude. Uh, what he called it here, rude destruction of his blissful state. And um, there's a lot of material about hospital procedures and how they traumatize babies. Uh, 
mainly by removing the baby for too long. So we talked about in the last video, if the baby is removed from the, removed from the mother, the mother, the mother starts to uh, more uh, the hormones that were produced at that moment of birth. It's a, it's a time sensitive moment when the baby's born. The mother produces lots of hormones for the baby to bond, to, to bond and latch and start suckling and nursing. And the, so the skin to skin contact, the warmth is there, the smells are there, the, the room is warm, the lights are dim with candles. You want to recreate the smooth womb like, womb like continuity into the extended womb. So humans come out too early, they need an extended womb. So you want to, you want that continuity there. So the baby comes out, ideally, hand placed on the mother's front, and he starts suckling. Usually, they said, or soon afterwards. Huh? Again, I'm not a doctor. I'm just so my disclaimer there. But ideally, it's called a lotus birth. The cord stays, the placenta stays. They're part of the baby. The cord is still pulsating with oxygen and blood and nutrients. You want to leave the cord there. The placenta was like his life source. It was like it was like God. It was everything to him, right? The, the placenta. It was his connection to the universe, to his mother. It's a very powerful uh, phenomena there. And they said, well, it looks messy. No, well, big deal. Just put the put the placenta in a, a bowl. You can cover it, I guess. Lay it, sit it, let it sit on the bed. The cord will fall off on its own accord. Let the baby have that smooth transition. You don't want there to be this, uh, what do you call it here, rude destruction of them. The shock. You don't want birth shock. You want like a smooth transition. Baby comes out, hand it to the mother. He recognizes his mother. The hormones are there. Now the hormones are there to help not only the baby latch onto the mother and have that secure uh, bond to the mother. Now the baby has entered into the maternal holding environment. The second womb is called the maternal holding environment. The mother's holding the baby. The baby's lying on the mother and he can nurse as he needs. It's all according to the baby's needs. And the mother is uh, there to meet the baby's needs unconditionally so she has a symbiotic relationship with the baby meaning she's a symbiotic object for the baby or a self object for the baby now at the moment of birth because of the hormones they help not only the baby to bond to the mother but they help the mother to feel this connection within herself click click that she can be a mother now she has this um, kind of a in syncment with the baby, now she can read the baby signals. She can be attuned to the baby signals. So she gets it. So now there's no malattunement, misattunement. Baby, you need it, what you got, you, you get it. You need this, you're uncomfortable, you got it. You want it, right? The position's uncomfortable, you want to switch, yep, yeah, you got it, whatever. You, so the, the womb life safety, the, bliss, the blissful Garden of Eden continues. The Garden of Eden has to continue. If babies don't get that, it leads to a variety of uh, personality patterns, as discussed in previous videos. But the baby needs to enter into this psychological, it's also called a psychological egg, because if they enter into this second womb, they need it to know themselves later on. They're still growing and developing. If they're shock traumatized and they're frozen there, they never really know themselves. The main emotions are going to be hate, greed, envy, grenvy, spite, vindictiveness, schadenfreude. Now the melancholia that they can't feel, it's going to be masked over by them by um, the manic defense, you know, um, power and control, narcissism, cynicism, one-up status, grandiose, taking refuge in the grandiose part cell, the search for glory, uh, meaning status and power. You see, they're stuck in this so-called survival personality mode because the amygdala is enlarged and it's just fight or flight in the mind. In the movie, we saw that in the movie Inside Out, the Disney movie Inside Out, when those feelings were gone, joy and sadness in the other world there, all you see at the, count, at the console, for the person was the, the the fear and the anger characters and there was a third one right? so we don't want the child to have an inflamed amygdala right from the beginning and he's stuck there then he, never, he feels like something's missing all the time he's always in survival mode all the time uh, you know, so if the, another golden winning of the mind award in relation to the amygdala is uh, Bob and his enlarged amygdala well, the coffee's starting to kick in now, it's starting to wake up a little bit. Oh. Okay, Bob and his enlarged amygdala has won a Golden Windmills of the Mind Award. They, they, uh, 30 minutes long, it's a home movie, but that's one of the best movies, that's one of the best educational movies there is. Simple, funny, 
Uh, I love the speech that Bob gives at the end and his answers to the questions when he was interviewed. Uh, it's a great, uh, that's one thing I'm proud about. That's another one of the things, another one of the, another thing that I'm proud about with 1001 with News of the Mind are these awards. We have 21 awards now given to excellent material, uh, whether it's well known or not. Uh, so the Disney movie is well known, Inside Out. So that one has that has won a Golden Windmills of the Mind Award. But Bob's enlarged amygdala. Very few people know about it. Okay, let's let's uh, continue with uh, this theory that birth trauma is the most influential factor in whether or not the child is going to grow up healthily or neurotic. Um, the greatest protagonist of the birth trauma theory is Otto Rank, who claims that prenatal experience is normally supremely pleasurable and the experience of birth a tremendous psychic shock. With birth, there comes not only a cataclysmic change, both in environment and modes of functioning, for example, temperature, light, noise, handling, etc., but also the former security and freedom from effort and disturbance is lost, and feelings of helplessness and anxiety arise. Rank maintains that traumatic potentialities are always present in the birth situation through the severing of the physical and emotional attachment to the warming, nurturing, protecting mother. Okay. The deepest levels, the deepest levels of the individual never, never accepts, never accept this uh, severance. And the whole later existence is a reaction to this trauma. So then somebody came up with that joke. We spend the first nine months of our lives trying to get out of the womb and the rest of our lives trying to get back in, in reference to birth trauma. We want to go back to where it was safe and redo, and redo the cha and redo it, uh, redo the birth. So they're going to recreate situations in the environment to see if they can redo it. That's ridiculous. They can't do it. Now Lloyd DeMoz has a very provocative theory about that. What in, the, what in the present can simulate the kind of drama uh, that Odysseus felt on the ocean there that would represent the kind of emotional drama the baby went through in the birth process? So that's, he, he thinks uh, that's why people enlist to have that kind of dramatic experience, near, near frightening experiences. Uh, they they want to master it and redo it. It's not going to work, of course. You can't travel back in a time machine to see. See, again, the, the stencil, the schema, was created in the timeless, in the timeless unconscious. So the person goes through time, but the timeless unconscious is running the show, influencing the person to try to unfreeze that frozen, crystallized state of the trauma. Right? So repetition compulsion is related to this trauma. And it's frozen in timelessness, so it's carried over into the present. So the present is like a recreated symbol of the past. Now, if there's birth trauma, Lloyd DeMoss says, what can a person do? Dangerous activities, dangerous sports, something near all these uh, scary things. Um, and he says, well, maybe these people enlist. And, uh, and that, maybe they're trying to unconsciously recreate something. If they're on the field and things are so scary, maybe... I. Lloyd DeMoz, uh, you got, you got, I can't do it justice here. Lloyd DeMoz explains it in his books there. Uh, we have a few of his quotes. Great, lot, we have a lot of great material from Lloyd DeMoz. Uh, he, he's, he's really said some important things. I guess that's the birth trauma one, right? So that's not a bad quote there, yeah.
Let's see anything else for Charles. Let's dig up yesterday, because yesterday we talked about her trauma as well. What did we say yesterday? Jeez, my memory isn't there. Let's see if I can dig up yesterday's one. Um, let's see, where is it? Oh, here it is, birth trauma. So from the same book, um, go hold on here. Birth trauma, according to Sachs, auto rank looks upon the transference um, or the analytic situation uh, as a reproduction of the intrauterine state. Rank himself says that in transference, object hunger is uh, manifested. It serves also, he says, the purpose of ego unburdening. Frenzy says that rank, uh, that, that, uh, that um, According to Rank's view, at the deepest instinctual level, the biological attachment to the mother regularly dominates the analytic situation. Okay, so there's the power of it all. The, the, yesterday's quote. The baby has a biological, instinctual urge to bond to the mother. That's the primary thing. Okay, that is, that's traumatized there. In the analytic situation, meaning in the therapy room, the two people there, it's this biological urge to have this kind of strong attachment. So-called object hunger, he says, right? a little bit about it. So let, let's let's get back to uh, today's quotes here. Okay, so the, the next quote um, you mentioned already about the woolly mammoth. What is particularly characteristic of the psychoanalytic perspective is its emphasis on the persisting influence of certain childhood wishes and fears despite later experiences that might be expected to alter them. So that's why the billionaire doesn't change. He's still a greedy, he can still be very greedy and narcissistic and hoarding and selfish and all of these things. He can't change it. It's past that critical time. He's operating from the script. He's replaying the script, the, the broken record. So if something good happens, he gets a billion dollars, it doesn't change all that symbolic mother, money, mother, it doesn't, it doesn't sink in. It doesn't create new neural networks. It gets a lot of serotonin, it feels some pleasure, but it doesn't change his psychic structure. He's still greedy, and he's still dependent on it, that kind of thing, All right? Okay, again, what is particularly characteristic of the psychoanalytic perspective is its emphasis on the persisting, on the persisting, okay, repetition compulsion, persisting influence of certain childhood wishes and fears despite later experiences that might be expected to alter them. This is the timeless unconscious at work, or as Watchell calls it, the woolly mammoth situation. The woolly mammoth uh, image or view. Once trapped in ice, okay, frozen, the script is frozen. Sometimes, they, long ago, they would call it fate. Right? It, what they mean is the traumatic script. It's a stencil, it's a schema. Okay. We as a baby, we're little architects. We drew a schema for our lives, a schematic for our lives, unconsciously. It stays that way, unless we change it, right? Yeah. So I would say the emphasis here, number one, the image of the poor woolly mammoth frozen in there, that image conveys that the script is frozen and we're just replaying it. But I think, I like this quote for the emphasis on the timeless unconscious. It's the timeless unconscious at work. So whatever we're doing that's dysfunctional, it's the timeless unconscious at work, still protecting the parent. Because the schema was protect the parent by giving yourself up to please the parent. And we're stuck in that, unless we bring it to consciousness and talk about it kind of thing, right? Again, 21, 91 to 3, some good material. And uh, Russell's quote, uh, 21, 19 to 29, uh, some good material there. Okay, sort of on a lighter note here, uh, 2336, something called reframing. So this is not really psychoanalysis. It comes from a book on family therapy. 
sort of this supportive idea um, just to keep just to help the family stop arguing kind of thing so one example the family therapist offered was to do this thing called reframing um, I thought it's not bad it has a little bit of a it has a little bit of a It can lead to the psychoanalytic uh, area, right? So here's uh, the example here. Um, one member of the family uh, was uh, very messy and hoarding things and stockpiling things. Everything was a mess and uh, it was causing problems in the family. So, uh, so yeah, let's just read it here. Okay, so reframing. Here's an example of reframing. Families often habitually use quite damaging and hurt, hurtful terms to describe each other's and their own behavior. Quote, for example, so therapist says, quote, what you talk about as, quote, this disgusting mess, unquote, could I suppose be thought of as a kind of collection that a person cannot bear to give up something they have acquired and so they accumulate it all, a kind of collected past that they keep always with them? I guess there's sort of a question there, slightly rhetorical. Okay, okay, then you could go on, so the therapist was uh, instructing their students, student therapists, then you could go on to be interested in this collected past to find out what it does to relationships in the family. In time, the family will accept this description, which then allows them to think of the rubbish not as something blameworthy that they are helpless to confront, but as something with meaning and possibility. So it's a kind of interpretation in a way, right? I think it is, yeah. So this, this, maybe we can add this to our thread on, we have a thread on interpretations. I'm always looking for good examples of interpretations and creating a thread on it. And so, so this would be a good one to add, right? So the guy was hoarding things, it means he had something, he couldn't let it go. How do we, re, re, and then it was messy, everything was messy. How do we, we, how do we reframe that or offer a kind of interpretation of, so let's say the father's a slob and he's, he can't throw away anything, he's hoarding everything, let's say, right? Instead of just labeling it, what a disgusting mess, and people are fighting all the time, how can you be so messy? No. Well, let's, let's, let's reframe it. Well, he's collect, we can say he's collecting. Okay. Okay. Now, people collect memories. People have past memories, that's a collection. So he, he sort of maybe there's a link there. Uh, and he, and he, now if he's hoarding, maybe he's still trying to get mother's uh, love. He can't let go of mother. So every material, everything he collects, material means mother in the unconscious. It, it can. It, there can be, material can be a symbol. Remember, in displacement, a symbol stands for something else. So the, the stuff he's, he's hoarding, he goes to the garage sale, someone called it a garbage sale once. He goes to the garbage sale, the garage sale, <laughs> um, and he buys stuff, material. Uh, it can be a symbol. Material can be a transference of his emotion for the mother onto the material. So he goes to the garage sale to have all this material to have mother. So he's done a displacement there. So he's hoarding, still looking for mother. Now he can't let go of this stuff because that means he's going to be losing mother. So he's thinking, well, maybe we can think of his uh, his, his hoarding, that he, he's, a, he's a collector. What's he collecting? He's collecting things that, that might help him to remember that he needs mother. And he can't let it go because of the separation anxiety. So now he has, now this, all this bundle of rubbish is his collected past. We, as, as, a symbol for his collected past. So his uh, hoarding rubbish, his disgusting mess of stuff all over the place, is a symbol for his collected past, his psychological collected past. 
he can't mourn, still looking for mother's love, still looking for mother, protecting the mother by not being angry at the mother, creating this symbol for her, and he can't let go of her. Now finally, the family might think, okay, we have a choice. We can just label it and argue about it, or we can interpret it that uh, it, it's, it has meaning for the father, that this uh, pile of junk has meaning for the father, let's say. It has meaning for him. It's meaningful for him. Okay, it's meaningful for him. Okay, he's, he's still looking for mother, can't let her go. Separation anxiety, still needs her, never got enough of her to let her go, still looking for her. It has meaning. Now when there's meaning, there's possibility now. That's not a bad little quote there from a book. I just found it here from uh, Family Therapy. We'll have more quotes uh, from this book. I just found it this morning. So reframing is, uh, I, I think this, uh, it's, I, mean, I would regard reframing as a, a kind of interpretation. I think it's fair to say that. So reframing, I think, fits in with the psychoanalytic perspective. How are we doing here, yeah? You know, one thing I notice, uh, if I don't have to bounce around, my videos are much shorter. My last video, I could do it straight on this very spot. It was only two hours long, same with this one. And I didn't give a one hour long introduction to 1001, Winnie Mills of the Mind, as I sometimes do. If I'm feeling fresh and energi energized, I try to offer an overview of 1001, Winnie Mills of the Mind. I keep trying. Um, I hope some of this material has been of interest and help. I, I think the one on, I like the one on projection. Um, reaction formation, we had a little clarity there, finally. The birth trauma one. The woolly mammoth one and I, I like this example about reframing so if you know a hoarder so hoarding right so he's talking about hoarding and that pile of stuff might be like a symbol for the mother even right that's like the teddy before it provides comfort for him right? and uh, we all have it to one degree or another But this hoarding can be uh, over the top, and there's this manic panic quality to it, and he gets addicted to it, and he says, an exaggerated unconscious emotional emotionality is, yeah, so displacement. So displacement, so the guy who's hoarding all this stuff, he's displacing. Displacement is a process by which one idea, meaning his need for his mother, his love, may surrender to another, uh, meaning the stuff, right? The, 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 this collection of uh, broken trinkets or whatever it is. So displacement is a process by which one idea, okay, he needs mother, may surrender to another. Okay, I mean, his pile of uh, 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 yard sale stuff, right? The whole volume of its uh, emotionality, right? So one idea has the emotionality of needing love to mother, needing to bond to the mother, he can displace that and transfer it over to the pile of stuff, to the junk. That's called displacement. Now this dynamism, dynamism was first discovered, this phenomena, this mechanism of the mind, maneuver of the mind, operation of the mind, was first discovered in the study of dreams. The person has a lot of emotions to the parent, but even in the dream they can't accept it, it gets transferred over to someone else. Now you wake up and you dreamt about another person, but they were just the proxy placeholder, placement holder uh, for the true emotions towards the parent. So that's what that's what the Morton Kisam keeps saying. You think it's to one area, but it's really towards the parent. That's called displacement. You know? Symbolization is the same thing. You, through some association, something reminds you of the true source and you sneak in the emotion the emotions to that symbol or something that stands for the, the, the source so it's displaced as well right now this phenomenon of displacement can also be found uh, dominant to
to be a dominant characteristic in obsessional, obsessional neuroses where there, is display, where there is displacement of affect from that which is actually important to a triviality which may thus take on the coloring of great and urgent significance. Obsessional neuroses, again, 1930, right? I'm not even fully sure what that means. Maybe this is the OCD one or something, obsessional, right? Neuroses. Let's, so let's say the person is a fanatic uh, in, um, yeah, so let's say they're collecting something and they're very obsessional about it. It's got to be perfect. It's got to be exactly this way. And, or maybe they're setting the table. Everything has to be so perfect. Or may, maybe they're just a very hypercritical perfectionist, obsessional neurosis. So they displace the emotion from something that's very important to something trivial, right? The spoon wasn't uh, in the right position on the table, and they got all very angry about it. So it was displaced, the anger is towards the parent, but you displace it onto the spoon being put in the wrong position. Right? So that's uh, an example of displacement. Right? Again, uh, we can also find displacement. Displacement can also be found to be a dominant characteristic in the obsessional neuroses. So the perfectionist, let's say. So the perfectionist, right? Where there is displacement of emotion from that which is actually important to some trivial little thing. Now this trivial little thing can thus take on the full emotionality of great urgency. So the perfectionist is enraged over some trivial little thing because of displacement. It's meant for the parent. Now later on he, he says, quote, mistaken, associ mistaken associations. So displacement is a mistaken association. You're blaming, you're blaming <laughs> the spoon, uh, the misplaced spoon, uh, for what your mother did, something like that, right? mistaken associations. The substitute idea is suitable because, uh, because there may be some kind of little trivial association. It, it's very trivial. Um, I remember someone saying that, uh, and, and prejudice. Uh, uh, let's, let's not open that thread. Uh, we have a major thread, the, psych the psychoanalysis of prejudice, a major thread. Uh, another key thread, prejudice. So in prejudice, uh, the non-threatening substitute other may have something trivial. Maybe their name sounds like your mother's name or something, and you suddenly you transfer some trivial little thing. Maybe the person you're angry at, they're, yeah, maybe the, the name, there's a name resemblance there. It's just an accident or some trivial little thing. And your full emotionality is transferred, transferred over there. Just like in the dream world, in the unconscious dream world, the emotion towards the parent, you can't face that yet. So you transfer it to someone else to protect the parent. Because that's the schema. The schema that all babies create, uh, not all, to one degree or another, question of severity and degree uh, some may, may be so mild it's not an issue some more severe so it is an issue okay somewhere on a spectrum there the schema uh, may be dominant for some maybe mild for, for others major for or minor okay the schema is uh, blame others to protect the parent be dysfunctional okay to protect the parent the dysfunction can be you blame yourself or you blame others, whatever. The purpose is to blame the parent. The purpose is don't direct your true emotions towards, towards the parent. Because had the baby, let's say theoretically, the baby came out of the womb, was nursing in his mother's arms. The, mother, the baby says, where are you, mother? I want to suckle a nurse. Uh, mother says, oh, come on, I don't want to spoil you. Uh, no, I don't, I don't like this uh, nursing thing. Here's the bottle. Oh, my God. I'm very sure. No, where, where's the real mother? Uh, well, baby, I'm uncomfortable with that. I don't know. I'm uncomfortable with this, and I want to keep my appearance to uh, taunt the men at the office place. So, you mean my needs and wishes bother you, mother? Oh my God! Um, so he sacrifices uh, his feelings and wishes and needs uh, to protect the mother. That's that's a script there. That that's a stencil. It's, that's the woolly mammoth frozen ice image, right? It's, it's sort of stuck there. It's the crystallization or the frozen of a trauma. 
So that's an emotional trauma, psychic trauma. It's frozen there. It's a script. The script was, so the script then becomes in the timeless world is, so the script is, self sorry don't show your, don't know your feelings and wishes to protect the mother, to please the mother, to help the attachment. Um, later on, that can take the form of distracting yourself by blaming others or acting like the mother. You cannot direct your anger towards the mother. But let's, let's go back up for a second. So let's say the baby could express the anger at the mother. Let's say theoretically the baby could say, mother, I don't like it. No, stop this mother. Don't give me the bottle stuff. I, I want the real connection with you. And the mother says no, and then but the baby would be enraged. If the baby's so enraged, he might want to bite the mother or harm the mother in his desperation to take her in, and the mother would react and hit the baby or some awful thing like that. We don't know. So the baby can't risk it. The baby can't do it, even if theoretically he, he might try or something. It doesn't work, so he can't do it. The baby can't even go there. He's just enraged at being shamed. He can't fight back. So he has to have the attachment to the mother. So he gives himself up to protect the mother, to please the mother, to fix the mother, to save the mother. That's a stencil. Save the mother. And he's dysfunctional because of that. He sacrifices himself. Now when he sacrifices himself, later on it can lead to self-defeating behavior outward or as a defense against it. He identifies with the aggressor and shames others to communicate that his mother shamed him. Okay? So in negative magic gesture, the person will be negative towards others to communicate that the mother was negative towards them. Negative magic gesture. Okay? So that's protecting the mother. He'll blame others. Um, to, and that, that's how he's protecting uh, the mother. Because he might act like the mother, see his, he see his own innocence onto others, shame them to communicate that his mother shamed him. And that's how he's protecting his mother. Uh, at the same time, he sneak, it's condensation. He, he is sneaking in his anger at his mother, but he's protecting the mother at the same time. So it's a condensation. He's protecting the mother and showing his anger towards the mother. Right? So negative magic gesture means the baby was shamed, he identifies with the aggressor, okay? someone else, a non-threatening substitute other, okay? displacement, he displaces um, the experience with the mother onto the other, Sees, he sees, he identifies with the aggressor, sees his in it displaces his innocence on to the other, shames the other to communicate that the mother shamed him. It's called a negative magic gesture, another key, another key uh, thread called negative magic gesture by Edmund Burglar, one of our mentors. So, so the dysfunction, the, the, the take home message is dysfunction either towards yourself or You can't even hold it, so you're just so enraged, and then you blame others, you just, so it's displaced outwardly, or you're doing something self-defeating for yourself, or you're doing self, something defeating against others as a double, uh, a double insult because you can't even face the truth that you're really angry within, but you're angry outward. Uh, all of that is to fix the mother, save the mother, do what she wants, placate the mother, satisfy the mother. The baby's doing a lot of work here to please the mother. You know, so that, that's, the, that's the script. So dysfunction equals protecting the mother. That's the script the baby created at the very beginning. It's called the moral defense by William Fairbairn, another one of our mentors. The moral defense. The baby is like this little judge. He's going to say, all right, mother's all good. And, if he feels so bad, I, well, I guess he, he's no good. So that's, I'm okay, you're not okay. The baby was born with original faith and trust, but he creates this false existential belief to please and protect the mother, to make the mother satisfied, because she has all the power and the baby needs the mother. So the baby's got to do what the mother wants. So he's sort of protecting them. That's what he means. He's, the baby's sort of protecting the mother. The mother's there to protect the baby, not the other way around. So we have a whole thread on why a mother would be misattuned. Okay, again, with birth trauma, if the baby's removed, the, ba the mother may become misattuned because of that. Because the, because the hormones dissipated and she doesn't get the baby's signals. And then she's angry about her inability to be a mother. Now she's punishing the baby for this. It's not the baby's fault. You know, she should have said to the pediatrician or midwife or whatever, hand the baby to me directly. Unless there's a special, real severe, special case, emergency, hand the baby directly to me on the front. Don't leave the cord. 
leaves the smells, room, room is warm, no bright lights, no shocking experiences. Uh, a procedure, uh, if it's absolutely necessary, I suppose, but help the child have a smooth, warm tra transition, right? Make the mother comfortable, let her be relaxed, let the baby come out as he wants to come out. You know? Then he's looking for his mother and he starts nursing and it's a smooth transition. Then there's no birth trauma. We don't want birth trauma. What if auto rank is right? What if auto rank and others are right? That birth trauma is the most important determinant to whether a person becomes functional and happy or dysfunctional and neurotic afterwards. What if it's, simple? What if it's that? Because one theory is that when the plunder system, when we went from a, oh boy, I'm not gonna do the, the thread on the plunder uh, global pillage. We went from global village uh, to global pillage 10,000 years ago, but in order to pillage, they decided to remove the babies from the mother to traumatize them. When the baby's traumatized, he, used that, he uses that splitting mechanism, goddess and demon. And that's what's needed for later on to think in these all either or all nothing terms yeah. and that leads to us and them as well us or them right it has that kind of us, us versus them mentality so it's goddess and demon right because the demon you deny uh, I, I don't want to open up that thread that's a, that takes about an hour to go through uh, about the sociological factors that contribute to prejudice we have a whole thread uh, pardon me we have a whole sub thread that's linked to our main thread on the psychology of prejudice called the sociological factors leading to prejudice. And part of that sub-thread is the birth of the global pillage model with the discovery of farming and agriculture roughly 10,000 years ago. And then we got the serotonin and maybe the ice age, let's say, a woolly mammoth got frozen or something. Yeah, so there must have been some kind of weather problem if there's such a thing as a woolly mammoth still frozen in the ice. How did that happen? There must have been some abnormal weather issue for a woolly mammoth to be stuck in an ice box like that. Assuming it's true. Apparently somewhere in Siberia there's a, an actual woolly mammoth, according to the internet here, there's a woolly mammoth literally in a block of ice. He's just stuck there. That implies something must have happened, right? With the weather. So if there was a panic, People wanted to pillage, uh, to hoard uh, to, for safety, to build a farm, so they wanted to grab and hoard. So the basic idea is that when people discovered farming and agriculture 10,000 years ago, it was kind of like winning the lottery. Like, whoa, we can unlimited free food kind of thing. But then maybe there was a weather problem and people panicked. Now, now when people won the lottery, they got used, the brain adjusted to all of the chemistry around it. So the issue of serotonin. And then what if they don't get what gave them that serotonin? They panicked, entered the pillage. Now how do you pillage? Because up until that time, it was a global village. Tolerant personality. I'm okay, you're okay. All babies were loved. They suffered the children. They traumatized the children. They gave them, the birth. They gave them shock trauma at birth. Now the baby has the splitting mechanism. So the splitting mechanism was created, was imposed upon. Her. The condition was created for the baby to, to make him desperate to use the splitting mechanism, and it's stuck there. Now when the, split, when the splitting mechanism is stuck there, he's going to think in either or terms all the time. And we've given several examples recently. I won't redo it here. So for more on that, the past several videos, we talked about the splitting mechanism. Yeah, interesting thread, yeah, interesting topic. So anybody who So the theory is if the babies are traumatized, they were shamed by the mother, they're gonna identify with the aggressor. There's their innocence, they're gonna see unto others. Then they say, I'm okay, you're not okay. Now when they say you're not okay, they mean themselves seen unto others. When they were shamed, it's repressed, when it's repressed, it's projected outward. Okay, they identify with the aggressor to shame others, to communicate that they were shamed. Their innocence is onto others, they shame others to communicate that they were shamed. So they say that they're okay, because the mother was okay, so they, they, they've become the mother, so they say, I'm okay. When they say others are not okay, again, they're talking about themselves seen onto others. So that's the mindset of, I'm okay, you're not okay. Now the emotionality is goddess and demon in there. 
At least that's called the prejudice, at least to the prejudiced personality. Now, the baby managed his stress at the birth trauma with the splitting mechanism. So later on, someone says to people, are you feeling stress, the weather problem, ice is coming, whatever it is? Oh, we can just say us, and, us or them. Right? Now, recently, one guy said, garden jungle. Whoa, those associations trigger the splitting mechanism. Garden jungle, whoa. That triggers the goddess and demon. Now there's the emotionality that you're, that the demon image of the devouring monster that wants to eat you image of the mother is seen onto others now. While you're aggressive, now while you're being the aggressor, you think the victim is the aggressor towards you and then you're justified for being, so double thing comes from there. In double thing, because of the fusion, the self and the other are still blurred at the beginning. It's one there. So the, the fusion is still there. So one can act the aggressor, feel like the victim, simultaneously project the aggressor onto the victim, thinking that the victim, uh, who's now the aggressor, based on your projection, just shamed you. And that's why it's like a loop there. So double thing, meaning they can act one, feel the other at the same time. Yeah. So, so that's, the, so it's, uh, So the prejudiced personality uh, was created, was an outcome of the panic to plunder and pillage. So we went from a global village with a tolerant personality. We were homo naturalis, I'm okay, you're okay. Then this cataclysmic event, I guess, um, at some point 10,000 years ago, so they invented this model called pillage. But to do it, you need the prejudiced personality. So you traumatize the people. Now with the global pillage, we, we went from homo naturalis to homo economicus. Now we're just thinking about money and plunder all the time. So that's the birth of the, the pillage. And we're still in it, right? 2,000 years later, we're still sort of, I guess we're trying to wean ourselves off it, maybe. But there's still remnants of it, right? Um, and uh, so we've got a lot of examples about that. But there's this innate drive for healing. The psyche seeks healing. So religion was born to prevent healing because the main motif in religion is goddess and demon. That entrenches the splitting. Now when people are conditioned to constantly think in these two terms, right? so they literally say goddess and demon in their stories. That's gonna trigger the goddess and demon in the unconscious. So they, they, they set it up for people. Then the propaganda guy comes along from the pillage and says, oh, garden forest, for example. Uh, that people, oh, that clicks up the goddess and demon. That's the prejudiced personality. Okay, when you when you have that kind of mentality, and you say uh, that leads to the us versus them, unfortunately, then the them uh, is going to be the pool of poorly paid workers doing all the work. And so billions of people in poverty, they're doing all the work, and and people don't care about it. That the, the aggressors don't care because they felt their mothers didn't care about them. So it's a negative magic gesture. See, mother, you didn't care about me. I don't care about them. I don't care about them because I want to show you you didn't care about me. So they're a caricature of their mothers. When people are, when people are traumatized and they identify with the aggressor, they become a caricature of their mothers. They're going to do to others what the mother did to them to show up the mother. They're going to be like this exaggerated cartoon of their mother. You know? So they, they're, they're loyal to the mother and they're trying to show her up at the same time. So it's, it's, it's a condensation there. So the, so the pillage system sort of depends on that because um, later on someone might say, doesn't it bother you? You created all this poverty? Oh, the, oh, the others? Uh, that's the them. Uh, what do you mean? Well, they're operating from the, the babyhood survival mechanism of the splitting defense. So the baby felt good when he, he felt relieved. He found a way to deal with the stress of being removed from the mother. He found a way to manage that in his brain. It's stencil, it's stuck, it's a frozen, the woolly mammoth has frozen image. He's, it's stuck, something in his brain is stuck like that. And what, what's stuck is this schema, this script, meaning um, to deal with anxiety, think in either or ways, all good, all bad, idealized, devalued, all, all or nothing thinking, this kind of all good. This is all good and that's all bad, idealized, devalued. You think of this kind of splitting mentality way, so you're always one up, one down, that kind of thing. You don't see shades of gray, you don't see the context, you don't see the history, you don't see what led to things, you don't see the, the 
positive intentions and the efforts and the struggles and the tr people trying to, you don't see, just, just forget all that, just us, this good, this bad, just keep it simple, that's what the baby did, the baby did think, oh, mother's a demon, no, that's not my mother, mother's a goddess, yes, that's my mother, he, he did some tr desperate trick and he, he believed, that's a splitting mechanism, it's a desperate maneuver, and if that's crystallized there, that's frozen there, that's, that leads to the prejudiced personality. Religion entrenches it. Religion is to preempt healing because they're constantly reinforcing this imagery. Then that, that uh, propaganda guy came and said, oh, garden jungle recently. We talked about it recently. He didn't say directly, we good, they bad. He didn't directly say that. He just said, oh, we're living in a kind of garden and outside the garden, it's kind of like a jungle. He's, and he hopes that'll trigger, that'll trigger the us versus them mentality. See, so he's just subtle about it because he doesn't want to directly say because people might resist it but he he's he just says something softly and then it triggers the us versus them and now now the people think they're going to project their frightening mother onto innocent others and uh, so on and he says do you feel st so the baby felt stressed at the trauma he dealt with it by splitting later in life they can refer to that schema schema schemata the schema the PR guy can say, do you feel stress in your life? Well, us versus them. That's what the baby did. Okay, It's the same Gant, it's the same technique, of, it's the same thing with uh, the religion. The guy at the podium can say something to trigger your unconscious. So the guy at the podium says, um, he doesn't say imagine the breast in the sky. He'll describe the breast in some other, he'll describe the breast to get you to project the breast onto the sky and feel and feel nursed by it. So he's going to get you to recall a good feeling you had while nursing or in the womb, then you say you're a believer. So he doesn't directly say, imagine the placenta in the sky and there's a cord there and you're, accepts you and loves you unconditionally, therefore you, sees you, knows you, omnipotent, all-powerful. He's describing the breast and the placenta. So he's, he's using the words, the descriptive adjectives of the placenta and the breast, but he's not saying it. Then that triggers the, in the unconscious those, the placenta and the breast, then the people say they're a believer. So somebody in the present says something to lead to the triggering, the clicking up, triggering up of something that's in the conscious. So that's one mechanism of religion, right? And now the PR guy does the same thing. Do you feel stress? Oh, just use, either, just use garden. He'll say something that'll lead to the goddess and demon clicking up imagery in the mind. Right? Like for example, garden, forest, uh, jungle, or that one there. So. Um, so religion is a tool of the plunder system, right? So religion prevents healing because the purpose of religion is to entrench the splitting mechanism because that's needed for the prejudice. Then later on, the PR guy steps in. Okay, thanks, the religious guy. Step aside, I'll take over. Okay, do you feel stressed? So both are doing the same thing. The guy at the podium says, do you feel stressed? Imagine the breast in the sky. Okay, so he steps aside. The PR guy, whatever, steps aside. The pillage spokesperson steps in and says, hey, do you feel stress in your life? Well, us and them. But he won't say it directly. He'll say something that leads you to think goddess and demon mentality. Now, of course, it's all cloaked over with what's called rationalizations. Fake lies, makes it up, he doesn't care. All he wants to do is click, trigger up your emotions. Once you trigger up the emotions, no one cares about reason anymore. That's, that's the gambit, right? That's the trick. So he could lie, people may consciously argue, but if he just keeps, if he's, if he's persistent with the lies, it's, it's meant to trigger up uh, the unconscious imagery, and then people react from that imagery. It's very, it's very powerful, it's a puppet master, it's very powerful. Right? That's why we need psychoanalysis to uh, calm ourselves down. And we gotta, we gotta interpret the people doing this. They're in this manic panic, they're, they're not facing uh, their arrested development. They're not aware of how they're protecting the mother. We got to interpret what they're trying to communicate. They're trying to communicate to their mothers in the mind what happened to them. So they want to say, they're trying to say to the, us, look, I felt impoverished by you, mother. So a lot of behavior is a communication. Negative behavior is a communication that something negative happened to them. Pre prejudice absolutely is a symptom of uh, trauma, the splitting defense mechanism. 
based on trauma whether that trauma occurred in the womb at birth or within uh, the age of uh, 18 months I can't I can't do it I can't summarize that thread it's, it's too much it is I need to, uh, to flesh it out there's more there's more to it so we have a that's that's sub thread the sociological factors that contribute to prejudice we talk about the plunder system religion the PR things uh, the propaganda meaning and the movies and uh, documentaries that promote and education that promotes prejudice Jane Elliott says if you graduate high school and you're not prejudiced it's a miracle you, know, you should have gotten an F uh, so the educators are selected because they have the prejudice mindset that's how you be, that's how you're accepted basically um, if you're kind of tolerant like that I that teacher has a lot of work to do you know the education system is just sort of they're like the key, George Carlin said right just teach them enough to operate the machines no, don't don't teach them to know themselves or heal themselves these kinds of things the social studies oh my god oh my god it's pitiful they, they don't students don't learn about Pierre Gint that's an important story for men the Odyssey we didn't they didn't learn about it properly right uh, they're just bombarded with negative stories you know So the teachers might enjoy that, you know. Teachers might uh, enjoy the negative stories to externalize how they feel, to communicate how they feel. They feel badly within. They want the students to feel badly. These kinds of things. So the, the teacher selection is pretty, pretty bad. I think pretty, uh, pretty bad. It, it, the teacher selection is just a continuation of the milieu up the pillage, right? create the prejudice personality. Religion entrenches the prejudice personality. Education is a part of it. So all to set it up so that the PR guy can come in and say, garden, garden forest. Oh wow, God is a demon. Then that's the plunder. So we're still plunder. Why are we still in this plundering thing? It was an accident. People won the lottery 10,000 years ago. My approximate example is what if today 2022, the year 2022. What if today everybody won a trillion dollars? What if today, right now, today, everybody won a trillion dollars? Wouldn't there be this panic? Wouldn't there be this chaos kind of thing, this confusion and all of this confusion and chaos? Now, some people might say, don't do it. It'll cause a lot of problems for all of us. You think people are gonna listen? Now, a few people might. 10,000 years ago, those were the indigenous people that we know of today. The indigenous people say, no, we don't do this. We don't uh, farm and agriculture. They, they understood it. It would cause problems. Nobody's saying we go back, of course. We're just trying to understand what's going on. But what if everybody won a trillion dollars today? There'd be this mad panic. Some would benefit, a lot might not, right? And then there'd be this kind of traumatic, maybe like a, a script is kind of set up. And, and then there's intergenerational trauma. I don't know. Just, just just searching around for ideas. Again, these are all hypotheses. Everything in 1001, Winnie Mills of the Mind, is a hypothesis, it's a theory, it's a, it's a discussion, or a searching, or brainstorming, associating idea. We're looking for ideas. Once in a while, a great idea comes along and it goes, whoa, yeah. Like Russell's quote about repetition compulsion. Like uh, Kisem's, uh, Morton Kisem's quote about dysfunction being in service of protecting the parent, uh, saving the parent. A few uh, burglars, uh, some of his ideas. Uh, so sometimes a quote comes along, uh, and for me personally, I'll get a, a, a dream that kind of freed me, freed me a little bit, you know, it gives me hope. Huh? Uh, so when you read something and you get a good dream, uh, that's a good sign, right? or you're starting to face something you can never face, that means you're, you're feeling that you can start to accept it, right? Then you, more energy comes back into you. Then you're a better singer on the stage. You see? So all of these quotes is us in dialogue with the guy in the basement, right? Basically. 
some of it we can take back and we feel better. Like the singer sings better. You can sing in a better way, right? Okay, maybe um, I think I'll just start to wind down here. Okay, so we did projection, reaction formation, displacement, birth trauma, the one about the woolly mammoth, and the last one here. Oh, about the hoarding guy. How do we, how do we uh, provide a mild interpretation called reframing? So we're understanding the father. The father was a slob, hoarding everything. Well, he couldn't grieve. He can't let go. Still looking for mother. Hoarding, right? So material, mother, connection there. Oh, oh, it happened again. Oh, what a pity. Well, that's too bad. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. I guess I'll just wrap it up here in the elevator. So, <laughs> so thanks very much. This has been TQ 32, 33, 31 to 33, 36, I believe. I'll see you next time. Thanks very much. Bye for now.